Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and a new friend. And today we're talking about guilt and self-atonement. But first, let's introduce our new friend. He's a former classmate of mine. Do you want to tell us about yourself, Jacob? Yeah, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> uh, glad to be here. It's Thanks like a for, real radio uh, show. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, so I'm uh, a bit of a dilettante. I like to be I don't know okay. what that word means. So. Oh, it's it, very simple. I'm not good at many things, but I'm interested in a lot of things. Oh, great. So, That's like me. Yeah, exactly. It's great. You know, it's it's good for a dinner conversation and not much else, but, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> Cocktail um, parties. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good for little factoids and trivia. Yeah, no, I just, I really enjoy, um, like, studying history. That's kind of been uh, mostly what I've been doing for the last couple of years as far as um, anything studious goes. But, yeah, that, I love watching movies. I've done some film reviews. No, I mean, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Great. We are very glad to have you with us. Last week, we talked about the myth of neutrality, that is the nature of knowledge and the ethical nature of knowledge, that how we know God personally, our personal attitude toward him shapes our knowledge, uh, what what our mind perceives as rational, etc. Today, we're talking about guilt and self-atonement. So there's still this idea of ethics that we're disposed to believe in good and evil, to recognize this idea of guilt. Uh, when we talk about guilt, what are we talking about, Greg? That's usually where we have a problem, asks the average teenager and probably the average <laughs> American. What guilt is? It's when you feel really bad because you think you've done something wrong. No, that's not guilt. You said that we're still in ethical categories. We could back up a step and say that Christianity alone deals in ethical categories because we stand face to face with the creator. Uh, we've talked about covenant who demands, requires uh, our obedience because he has the right to, because he's God and we're not. And we're made in his image. And as you say, we have that natural tendency of thinking in terms of right and wrong. But all the other religions and philosophies of the world don't have that category. Christianity is ethical and covenantal. Well, there are other religions of the world are metaphysical. They deal in essence. Man lacks essence. He lacks being. He lacks substance. If he could get more, mm. he if he were more divine, higher on the scale of being, then somehow that would solve his problems. His problems are either physical or physiological or educational or financial. It's his environment, the environment beyond himself or the environment of his own body. We could just fix those things then man would be fine. And although man might do many bad things, I'm thinking back to Ghostbusters, that would be bad. This good, bad <laughs> thing, what is that all about? And, and, and the world doesn't have an answer because there's no creator to define good and bad. And so they wag their fingers at us and say, you Christians are evil. And we respond, by whose standard? And what is this evil word you're using? And what is this good, bad thing you're talking about? You don't seem to have categories for that. Yeah, um, so pagan ethics is more on a on a gradient or a curve in mm -hmm. comparison to Christian ethics. Yeah, we're, they're, they're trying to go from an unsatisfactory position, unsatisfactory for whatever reason, their own feelings, their own sense of lack, uh, the voice of society, the superego, whatever. Something doesn't make them happy and they want to be better somehow, <laughs> but they lack a standard by which to define that. And so they're always looking for something that's better. And in terms of which they can judge and condemn everybody else, because of course that makes us feel a lot better right. when, I, when I can say I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> where does the concept of revenge come into this? I'm thinking of the Oresteia where we have where Orestes has committed murder or taken vengeance as he saw it, and the Furies come up from the ground and they stand him on trial. What are they what are they doing there? That's an excellent question. And in fact, the last play ends 
yeah, with the uh, audience getting to vote <laughs> on whether or not he's guilty or not. Because, yes, he had to, let's see, what's the sequence? He has to avenge his father. Failure to avenge your father is one of the greatest crimes. But to do so, he has to kill his mother, which is equally a great crime. So no matter what happens here, he's screwed. <laughs> and he pleads to the Athenian audience to free him from the Furies and acknowledge that he was, he did the best he could with an impossible situation. But when we look at the Furies, we have to ask, who are these things anyway? And what right have they to go around beating up on people? The same right, basically, that a playground bully or a mob boss has to beat mm. up with people who screw <laughs> up their territory. There is no appeal to anything absolute. Zeus does not step in and say, I have ordained all things, hear ye me. Apparently, he sits back and watches the whole thing. Wisdom herself in Athena is got nothing here. There is this sense that there should be a right and wrong, but you're talking to divine energies and trying to convince them they're wrong. <laughs> what? Uh, this this is where paganism gets caught. They they have the inner sense, the feeling, the impress of the image of God that says there's a right and wrong, and we shouldn't do the wrong. But then. They can't answer with any definitiveness what the wrong is, nor can they explain why it is. That is, that there's a creator God who's ordained these absolutes for men to live. And so they're left struggling. And you, you peel back to the Greek tragedies, you turn on Netflix, <laughs> and you get these same kind of struggles regularly. My girls were watching, my whole family was watching a movie last night called The Shooter. I not too good with all of the actors. Danny Glover is the bad guy. And uh, the, the hero, the protagonist, is set up as a, as an assassin. Someone who looks like he's trying to assassinate the president, but missed and got the archbishop of Ethiopia. There's a long drawn out what's going on here. But he's, what's the word? When you make somebody look guilty and they're not. Framed. Set up. Frame. There you go. Right. He's yeah. framed. He spends the whole time trying to unframe himself. And at the very, almost the end, he unframes himself. And the Attorney General of the United States acknowledges, you're free to go. You're not guilty. But bad guy, Danny Glover. Yeah, we have no laws that can touch you because the crime you did actually was Ethiopia. Got nothing. And and Danny Glover goes off gloating. And we're wondering, well, that's lame. Certainly, there's they're going to pull some kind of legal trick. Maybe Ethiopian soldiers are there to arrest him. Uh, deportations better arrange something. No, no. The mm -hmm. bad guy goes back with other bad guys. And they're gloating in their cabin about how great they pulled this off and how what their next horrible thing's going to be. And the hero comes and blows them all up. And that's where we leave it. And you're left oh, saying, uh, uh. <laughs> Well, they, so deserve, <laughs> they deserve to die, but but you don't have the authority to do that. I mean, the attorney general sort of did a wink, wink, nudge, nudge at you, but he didn't actually say you had any authority. You just did this on your own, and now you're a murderer. But they were murderers. They would have gone on murdering. But And TV loves this. Movies love this. We were thrown into this existential crisis of who's right and who's wrong, and we don't have an answer. We have gut feelings, they deserve to die. He's our hero. We should vote for him. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. So we're back to the Christian idea of guilt is not an emotional response to things that make us feel bad. Guilt is a legal state that we have before God and his law, before the justice of God. When we have broken God's law that we, in fact, did know very well and we ought to be punished. We deserve to be punished. God has said in his word that if we break this law, we fail to do this or we do this thing we're not supposed to, here is the assigned punishment and, and you deserve it and you knew it was coming and that's your guilty state. You can feel really bad about that fact. You can not care. You can be a sadomasochist and revel in the fact that horrible things are coming to you. None of that's relevant to the fact that you are, in fact, guilty before the law and you deserve to be punished. And God will most certainly punish you. Do you think there's value in telling those tales of moral ambiguity to show people that we are just appealing to our subjective notions of ethics rather than anything 
truly objective, or do you think it could just lead them to find some false object, what they think is an objective standard, but is, you know, not, not a non-biblical standard? Well, I think your question there is, what do people take away from a story? And how do right. we make sure it's not the thing we don't want them to take away? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because some people are stupid. <laughs> they say, oh, that was great. That means I get, no, that's not what we were trying yeah. to communicate at all. Um, yeah, can we, I, I am not sure to what degree a writer of fiction is responsible for the intelligence of his, or the moral sensitivity of his audience. Right. I, I, I think we, we all get that. If you're going to tell a story where the bad guy gets away with it or the good guy falls and down to the level of the bad guy in order to solve his problem, I, I, I think we all kind of get the idea that somewhere in, in the wrap-up, a little bit of poetic justice is not totally out of line where either something to readjusts the scale or at least some wise old guy or some little kid stands up and says, but that was bad. And, right. and, and leaves us with some some degree of moral clarity, how, however you want to do that. Uh, and, and the best writers, of course, have found ways to do it that aren't hammy and sloppy and, yeah. and overly <laughs> sentimental or heavy handed. But, you know, that's a good question. To what, to what degree can we use moral ambiguity? I think we can use it a good deal. We mm -hmm. just have to be really, really careful or people do, do come away with the wrong idea. In, in God's stories, people, bad guys generally get theirs. It just may take a really long time. Yeah. Whereas the covenant, with the covenant people, it may take 400 years before God's justice catches up. Mm -hmm. God is on his own timetable. And the fact that we deserve punishment does not mean that God renders it all now here, let alone very quickly. And then that's one of the problems when literature tries to imitate reality what what do you do with a man who apparently got away with it? I mean, we're trying to tell a real story. Or maybe we're telling a real story, you know, based on a real event. That guy's got away with this. Do we just leave it there? Do we flash forward? You distract years? them like in It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life where Mr. Potter actually gets away with the, yeah. with the cash. <laughs> but we're just all focusing on Jimmy Stewart because he makes yeah. us happy. He makes us happy. And, and the message is money doesn't matter anyway, especially when your friends give you lots of it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. There's, there's, there's one. I'm sure. We and fractional reserve banking is totally cool. Totally yeah. fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't even talk yeah. about that. One. <laughs> <sighs> so you know, we've, we're, we Christians, let alone the world, we're still hard pressed to tell stories well to get to get it down to where we actually we ourselves know who the good guys and the bad guys are, because we lack. Uh, what Van Til called epistemological self-awareness. We don't mm -hmm. often or always at least know our own system of morality, and we don't always notice when people violate it. I, I've, I've seen actually defenses of Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life because he's a capitalist, and this whole thing was originally conceived of as, uh, or at least a lot of people thought it was, an attack on capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and it, you know, when it came out, that was the, the whole um, communism capitalism thing was a real hot potato for the country. And uh, I forget which which agency, but somebody actually came along and said, um, this is pro-communist propaganda. And we look back and say, this is a dumb, st uh, I'm sorry, funny story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we're not, and, and yet again, you look at Potter's, that's not capitalism. That's fractional reserve banking. There's a huge difference. <laughs> oh my Jimmy goodness. Stewart was seen, closer anyway. Yeah. Have you seen Hail Caesar with no. George Clooney? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's hilarious. Do it recommend. <laughs> okay. There's this moment where, so this actor who is not very, but not very bright, but plays someone very bright and he's a very popular actor, but he gets kidnapped by Marxists mm. and he comes out and they're, they're all of these sort of secret, secret communists um, who have been in the film industry and they're writers and they're like pointing to different things and claiming credit for them. Like, oh yeah, did you see that movie? Huh. We like to think we changed a few minds when really everybody's just like, ah, oh, good movie, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So anyway, Jacob, thanks for the getting us off track, but that was a great off track. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um, 
let's look at Genesis chapter three as a little more background. We got as far last time as the woman making her epistemologically neutral decision to disobey God. And I can then, hear the air quotes around neutral. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I, I am glad I put them in there deliberately. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Is thou eaten of the tree? Where have I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord said to the serpent, and we, he, he doesn't get to answer. But uh, here, we, here we have this, this moment of, I won't say moral clarity, because they're not clear. Already their thinking is being dark and stained and shadowed by their own sins. But they realize that something has happened. This is the eyes of them both were open, which is what Satan said would happen. He just didn't quite mean it the way they took it. He had probably a better idea of what was going to happen since he'd been there and done that. Uh, so first they realize their own nakedness. That is, they are conscious of their sexual organs because they realize they've just polluted the fountain of, of humanity and they feel guilty there. Um, and so their first act of self-atonement, of covering up, is to cover up the, the consequence. They sew fig leaves together and make aprons. They, uh, they spontaneously invent sewing and go with that. Then when they hear the voice of the Lord, they run and hide. More specifically, they hide among the trees of the garden, which is to say in God's own sanctuary, because that's a great place to hide. <laughs> and when God calls them, Adam comes forward, but he lies. I was afraid because I was naked. That's not why he did any of this. And when God questions him further, did you eat? Then he begins blame shifting the woman. First, he blames society. Then he blames God, who you gave to be with me. Eve is a little more subtle. She blames occult forces beyond her control. The devil made me do it. But implied in that is it, 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 she is subtle here. She's smarter than her husband in some ways. Because the question is, well, where, uh, you know, there, there's this serpent thing. I don't know where it came from or who made it or what it's doing <laughs> in the garden. My husband's supposed to be guarding, but hey, none of my business if, you know, you guys aren't doing your job. I was just a victim here. I was just um, following orders. Yeah. I was just doing, the, you know, the, the, yeah. I, mm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I had a bad education here. Mm -hmm. And if my husband had done his job, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have listened to this. So that this is the nature of of sin. We we try to cover this whole we could talk for a while if you like about self atonement and all the things you can think of that we do as a people to cover up our sins or make ourselves feel better about our sins. Um, and then there's the whole thing of blame shifting trying to find someone else to blame for what we've done. What I, One thing I would like to point out in all of this is the abusive nature of sin. Mm. Uh, I don't know about where you all live right now, but abuse has been a hot button in California for quite a, quite a while. And it's to the point that it's taken on very specific meanings. It's what a man does to a woman in marriage most of the time. Uh, and in fact, to the point among some Christian counselors, I, I assume non-Christians too, but I hear Christians more than anything. Abuse is something that men do to women. It is an exclusively male sin, and it can involve all kinds of things, and and which is true, but they all are more or less equal. If the man is unsupportive, if he raises his voice, if he's demeaning, all the way up to beats her to a pummel or on the other extreme, simply ignores her. All of these are abusive. They're all on the same level, and it justifies the woman in doing whatever she needs to to make her life better. Walk out of the marriage, ignore the elders of the church, ignore the Bible, 
I'm ignoring the kind of biblical counseling because she has been abused. And as we look at this, yeah, sin's abusive. Wow. Surprise, surprise. It is an attack on God because it's a refusal to submit to his order and his rule. It's an attack on a neighbor because it's usually aimed at somebody real and we're trying to hurt them because we hate the image of God in them. And it's an attack on ourselves. It's, it's, it's self, it's sin against self because we too are the image of God and we don't want to conform to what we're supposed to be. And so we abuse everybody and everything to varying degrees. So yeah, sin's abusive. Sin brings upon us true moral guilt. And that's man's problem. And the rest of the Bible is about a solution. Yeah, there's, speaking of self-atonement, the different ways that we try to cover up and make up for what we've done wrong. Adolf Koberly, I believe. It's probably Koberly because he's German. Uh, <laughs> he's a German Lutheran who wrote a book called The Quest for Holiness, mm. about three ladders by which we try to ascend to heaven. The three ladders are moralism, mysticism, and rationalism. So this idea that we're going to try to figure out, you know, this perfect rational system that's going to tell us the truth, or we're going to try to seek, you know, mystical experiences, or there's that third ladder, um, the moralism, that we're going to try to gain for ourselves any shred of righteousness that we can find. And it's been said that the most successful false religions in the world are some blend of all three of these ladders. <laughs> Indeed. Sounds suspiciously like echoes of what scripture calls the image of God and man. Mm -hmm. Knowledge, true knowledge, knowledge of the truth, righteousness and holiness, or righteousness and true holiness, and dominion, responsibility, action. Whenever we act, we we tend to fall somewhat in one of these directions, but we're always holding the image of God. We're always dragging the others with us. So there's no religion that completely lacks rationality and some kind of stated doctrine. There's no religion that, that completely shuts down the emotional and sentimental. And there's no religion that frees man from having to do anything. But there, there tends to be some kind of emphasis and and yeah, the Christian church has been just as riddled by these kind of things as the pagan world has, because we sense something's wrong. Adam and Eve knew there was something wrong. They did not want to admit what that wrong thing was, because as they are making their excuses, they are still working off Satan's premises. They try to deceive God. They try to lie to God. They try to get around God, which means they are still conceiving of God as a finite, limited, less than omniscient being who they can con. And there's no, so there's no repentance here. They're out of touch with reality. They know that in some sense, God has followed through on his threat, but it can't possibly be as bad as God said. After all, they're still alive. They're still breathing. <laughs> their, their pulses are pounding. They can get out of this one. Watch. We just have to throw each other under the bus one by one. <laughs> so Eve throws, or Adam throws Eve, and Eve throws the serpent. The serpent doesn't get a vote. And so the, the abuse kicks in. If I blame other people and I turn against them, then maybe I'll come out okay. They, they, they start with the physical thing, just, just cover it up. They go to the hiding, and then they go to the blame shifting. And these, these are patterns that, that we, we see. Well... What, what are the things that we do in the 21st century to, to deal with feelings of guilt? We go, we get religion. We go to church. Uh, we go to a church that asks us to do stuff. Maybe that asks for a lot of our money. Uh, we help build the new wing of a hospital. We, we, we give, we, we work. There was, a, this is a sidetrack, but uh, there was a pro-life video that we showed at our school a long, long time ago. And it was made by a Roman Catholic organization. And a lot of what it said was fine. But as, as they interviewed individuals who were in the pro-life movement, most of them Roman Catholic, the constant theme was, this makes me feel better about my relationship with God. Hmm. I'm, 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 be, I'm more right with God than I was before. Those weren't the exact words. It's been too long for me to remember. But we all walked away saying, they're doing this to earn God's favor. They feel guilty. And this religious activity, this social religious activity, is their answer. 
But other people go other directions. Some people go for alcohol or drugs to drown their feelings. Uh, some people max out their credit cards. <laughs> some people go vegan. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and then and share Trump. the gospel of veganism. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a real thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's driven by a sense of guilt. And if not, not that you going vegan actually is going to save a single animal life anywhere, but you can feel that you're better than other people because you're not a monster. <laughs> it's not working, but we keep doing these things. Dieting of various sorts, ceremonial rejection of some foods, rituals of all kinds of things, cleansing rituals. And it washes even into our, our advertising. Back in the 50s or 60s, you know, there was a soap, I don't remember if it was ivory or what it was, but or zest, I think it was, for the first time in your life, feel really clean. Mm. The subtext there is very strong. Mm -hmm. We have this ongoing sense of some kind of guilt, corruption, something that isn't right. We want to be purified from it. We don't want to admit it's our fault. But we realize that no one else is fixing this, so we kind of have to. If the government could come up with a way to fix it, we would vote, oh, that would still be us trying to fix it, wouldn't it? You know, we, we're constantly caught in this. There's no such thing as right and wrong. And yet, and yet, and I need to be clean. And how am I going to do that? Or how am I going to forget that that's what I want to do? Forgetting is huge here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really enjoy minimalism as an aesthetic and sort of a, I like to listen to minimalists, I should say. But even that is an exercise in cleansing your life of materialism. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes along with a lot of things. Um, Marie Kondo, the uh, life-changing magic of tidying mm -hmm. up. Uh, yeah. yes. Yes. She's, she's not a minimalist, but a lot of minimalists listen to her. And she's not kidding when she says magic. Like, this is straight up Shintoism. Yeah. Um, and one of her big things is cleansing the air in a room. And people eat this stuff up, especially in, you know, America. It's a fad. It's mm -hmm. yeah. it's a trend. It's, yeah, I want to do what Marie Kondo does because she's adorable <laughs> and quirky. And I, oh, that quirkiness is actually a pagan religion? What? <laughs> yeah, and one, one of the ironies with this total tangent but um, within Japanese culture, we look at their homes and see how beautiful and clean and minimal they appear and everything. You actually go back and all of the wealthy houses, their house would look gorgeous. But then they'd have a storehouse that was, that was about mm. the size of the house that kept all of the furnishings, all the clutter, everything in there. And then they just change it out seasonally. But it looks really nice. Oh, <laughs> we were just discussing getting a storage unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it won't make you feel really clean. <laughs> and so this brings us, I mean, we could, we could talk more about this, but what, what haven't we thrown in, thrown in here yet? Um, sexual experimentation, sexual perversion, mm -hmm. pornography, uh, prostitution, homosexuality. You, you go down the list of things. Oh, sadomasochism, big, huge thing. People hurt themselves because they feel they need to be hurt. And they get released by suffering, which is not far from the monks and hermits of a previous mm -hmm. age who did exactly the same thing. All mm -hmm. of Martin Luther's struggles to feel right with God. And that brings us to the message of the Bible, message of the Reformation as well. How shall a man be right with God, Job asked. And mankind has come up with millions of different things and none of them work. The prophet Isaiah says, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The words in the original are as minstrous rags, minstrous mm -hmm. cloths. Uh, gross. Gross. Filthy. And those are our righteousnesses. Forget our sins. That's the good stuff. <laughs> and and when, when the Bible points us to Jesus as a penal substitute for our sins, as the, the sin bearer, the guilt bearer, the one to whom God imputed our guilt and our sin, then we see God's solution. We see God's love and mercy. The problem is, in order to claim that substitute, to, to lay hold on that mercy, we have to admit our guilt. And then we have to admit that we can't fix it. And those are two huge strikes at our pride 
and there would be <laughs> autonomy. Okay, so something's not right about the universe, but that doesn't mean I plan on giving up and letting go of my claims on divinity and autonomy. I'll, I'll figure this out. Just give me time. And that's the conflict of the ages from the garden through Cain and Abel onward. How will a man be right with God? And the most vicious enemies of the gospel have always been those who've arisen within the camp of the faithful. Cain was Abel's brother. We talk about family values. Mm. There's the original family value. Your, your brother believes in justification by faith through, through penal substitution. And you believe that you can bring your best works to God as they are, and God ought to be happy with them. And you find out that even God doesn't take you seriously. What do you do? Well, you can't kill God, so you kill your brother. And, and you kill him with reference to worship and sacrifice, because your worship, you want to insist on your worship of God and will not hear him. And all the way down to the cross, the, the, the people who murdered Jesus were not the prostitutes and the tax collectors. They were the religious leaders of Israel. They were people who were wholly convinced, eh, at least superficially, of their righteousness and their goodness. At the very least, they didn't appreciate their hypocrisy being prodded at, displayed before the world. And so they had to kill Jesus. And you can carry this on through the ages. Yes, uh, people out on the street, people, pro the prostitutes, the tax collectors, they most certainly need the gospel. But oftentimes they're not self-consciously enemies of the gospel because they've never even heard it because we mm -hmm. haven't taken it to them. But the place where we get the most opposition and the most creative replacement theories for the gospel is within the church itself. People come that near, as Cain did, to the very altar of God, and then turn aside and say, but wait, I've got a better idea. And this is the history of Scripture as we're waiting for Jesus. And this is the history of the New Testament church as it struggled to proclaim what Jesus had really done. Uh, and whether you go to... Um, to Romans or Galatians or the book of Hebrews or any of the any of the epistles or the book of Acts. This is the constant, the constant conflict between the human will to self-righteousness and self-atonement over against the claim that Jesus is the only Savior and that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. So I've been thinking of the man of La Mancha. That's what's in mm. my car stereo right now. So I've been <laughs> listening through the soundtrack. And I know that Don Quixote is not the gospel, but there's still a great illustration of this in that it's it's Sancho Panza and Aldonza who receive Don Quixote's grand vision of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's his his set, the cleric and the niece, who are all like, oh, no, you're crazy. We're going to lock you up. <laughs> uh, it's those who really needed it the most were the ones who received the greater idea without resistance. Well, been, with a little resistance. <laughs> There's some resistance up front. I've been having my class read Don Quixote for years, and sometimes I feel guilty about it because, yeah, it's a great it's book. So it's so long. <laughs> it's so <laughs> long. Two whole, yeah. But I do that in part to show them how the idea started and and how uh, Cervantes almost got there. He, in the second book, he's he's feeling for it. But it's not till we get to the Broadway show, Man of La Mancha, that we strip away, one, the great length of the thing. <laughs> and two, that we give, from the beginning, Don Quixote, a very fixed vision. Yeah, okay, so he's crazy as the world reckons things crazy. But there is a real Dulcinea, or a woman he at least perceives as Dulcinea, and from the beginning, he sees in her purity and beauty. And she laughs at that, and everyone else laughs at that. And yet, in the end, that's what she becomes. She believes a message of hope that his vision of reality is the true one. She trusts his vision. And yes, of course, it's not the gospel, but there are, there are echoes there. And in, in the, the songs, the, the man who will march into hell on a heavenly quest there's a great deal of beauty there as the closer it comes to approximating the gospel, the more mm -hmm. beautiful it all becomes and the, and the more it exceeds the original in many ways. 
Yeah, and I think there's a lot of value in that idea that he's a madman to everyone else, as you know, Christians are often perceived. Mm. But then when you see us hiding and running from God, what could be crazier than that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, what do you think, you think you're going to do? Because the only place that you can at least feel justified maybe is in your own mind. But even there, you can't escape it. You know, no. you're going to run into it everywhere you go. Yeah. Yes, I will hide behind this fig leaf and God won't see me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Who's crazy here exactly? Yeah. Yeah. I've always and wondered I, if there's a connection between the fig, ne- fig leaves that they sewed together in the Garden of Eden and the fig tree that Jesus curses on the way to Jerusalem because it didn't <laughs> bear any fruit. I'm like, there's something there. I'm not sure what it is, but there's something there. Yeah, fig trees run from the beginning to the end, and I have not thought about that, so I, I won't go out of it. Limb. <clears throat> but, <laughs> it, is, it is it is certainly something worth thinking about when god runs an image all the way through scripture doesn't always mean the same thing but there's there are attachments there's connections so, yeah i don't think it's just because it's good on a salad yeah <laughs> <laughs> there were no other trees to mention so i'll mention this one <laughs> with that we will switch to recommendations and i will go first because i'm actually prepared this time um, I have been reading Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago, which is a word I always have trouble pronouncing because I was homeschooled. And so I read the word <laughs> without ever pronouncing it or hearing anyone say it. Um, so it's not archipelago, it's archipelago. <laughs> um, but all jokes aside, it is really excellent. It's, uh, it's a hard read. Um, it's not fun, but it is really important. And I'm learning so much. There's so much that I just didn't know about Soviet Russia, what life was like. Um, It's been encouraging in some ways to see what the differences are culturally between that and where we are today in the United States, that we're not to the point where we're hunkering down and scared rabbits. People aren't being vanished yet. (laughs) But then it's, it's also been a sobering read to see this is where this goes. And these are actual terrible things that people have done to one another and how they did it. So do recommend, not for the faint of heart, but important. And it's a pretty quick one too, right? Sorry. Oh, um, well, (laughs) I tell you what, you read the first chapter, you've you've got some... Oh, really? You've like, it's the, the chapters are very short. It's, okay. it's pretty manageable. The, the bites of the elephant are small, if you will. <laughs> okay. um, but even if you just read the first chapter, I felt like so edified. Well, not, mm. you know, it's, it's not like it's encouraging, but <laughs> <Right>. it's, it's <laughs> heavy. I felt there was a lot of value added to my life by just reading the first chapter. So mm. if you take nothing else of the book, just read the first chapter. Mm. Well, Sotsenitsyn was something of a prophet to our generation when all the famous writers, literary figures, artists, were praising the Soviet Union to the skies. He was the lone voice who came out and said, um, none of you have been there and done that. I have. This is what's really going on. Mm-hmm. And he warned us that if you don't wake up, this will happen to you too. It can happen there. So it is, it's well worth the read and um, the terror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Have you ever read, um, what's the book? Uh, Matt Brisley recommended it to me. It's uh, post-war. It's like the history of Europe after um, World War II. Mm-mm. Really, really good. I don't agree with necessarily all of his presuppositions, but he does a good job with it. Uh, he goes over how most of uh, Western Europe was in love with Soviet Russia at the time. And then a little while after Stalin came around, they started going, you know what? I don't think this is as good as we thought it was. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> So it's called Post War. Post War. Who was the author? Do you know? It's hard for me to pronounce. It's uh, I think it's Junt J U N D T something like that. Okay. I'm guessing he's Scandinavian or something, but yeah, <laughs> uh, it was really good. Cool. And that's a piggyback. That's not your recommendation. No, that's just a piggyback. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> so, what is your recommendation, Jacob? Mine would have to be actually the new version of Little Women. Oh, directed nice. by Greta Gerwig. I think it was just released this January, and I came into it with no particular expectations. I like Greta Gerwig as a director. Um, she's done Lady Bird and a few other films, but it was fantastic. Really, really competently done, and considering it, it's only her second 
film that she shot, it just like, it's class all the way. The cinematography mm-hmm. is sharp, the editing, she kind of, I won't give too much away, but she kind of plays with two different storylines and sort of interlaces them in kind of a, a way that makes the two parts of their lives almost converse with one another. It's like the younger version of yourself talking with a slightly older, wiser, more cynical version of yourself. Really, really good. I haven't I haven't read Little Women before, so I don't hold any of that baggage with me. But the film itself was fantastic. I'd highly recommend it. I'm very interested to see it. I like I know intellectually and spiritually that Little Women the book is moralistic nonsense, but I enjoyed it nevertheless. <laughs> yeah. So I can't really judge. It's not only moralistic, it's thoroughly transcendentalist. Yeah. It's just that like, if I weren't a Christian, I would be a transcendentalist, not because it's the next <laughs> best option, but because that's the error that I am by nature inclined to. So I am yeah. glad your self-knowledge is so thorough. <laughs> <laughs> I, on the other hand, was ordered by a uh, my, my headmaster at a previous school to teach little women he had he had just taken over and he was trying to move things in the direction of his vision he was a gentleman about it all but i hadn't read it and by the time i got halfway into it i'm thinking this is the most horrible moralistic garbage i've ever seen why are christians attracted to oh that's right because most christians are moralists yeah. at least at least in the world i grew up in we as a christian community emphasize different things depending on your own doctrinal background your denominational background but where I grew up, moralism was the big thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. If you do this, you're better than these people. And uh, to read that was just nails on chalkboard. No, <laughs> actually, I like nails on chalkboard. I used to teach with real chalkboards. This was this was something else again. So, <laughs> Worse than nails on chalkboard. <laughs> you know, my, my wife does teach little women exactly for this reason, because it's a <laughs> great opportunity to talk about transcendentalism and moralism. <laughs> Certain traditions. Uh, within the last few years, emphasize being good. Mm-hmm. They tell their children at church, be good. You, you're, you've got a problem? Well, you need to stop doing that and you need to try harder to be good. Now, on paper, they're Trinitarian, believe in the deity and humanity of Jesus, believe in the cross and the resurrection, certainly believe in the Holy Spirit, and somehow he's connected with this doing good, we, we, we hear. And yet, overwhelmingly, it is simply do good, be better. Mm-hmm. And But the, the things wherein they are to do better are not always the things in Scripture. How many times in, in Sunday schools, all kinds of Sunday schools, are children told, you need to be good? And I, I think I've said before in this podcast that our school faced this once, where when I first came on board... I was trying to direct how the curriculum should go from from there on out, and, and particularly to emphasize we're going to be teaching all the Bible. We're going to start the Old Testament, work our way through, and it's going to be we're going to talk about Christ. We're going to talk about the gospel, and I define justification by faith. And one one lady teacher who was near that year said, "Well, wait, isn't that going to confuse the children when we tell them that it's not about being good? Maybe we should save that till later when they're older and can mm. understand it better." No. <laughs> No. no, that's definitely not what we should do. So we we will keep coming back to this again and again. Yeah. Um, that the the gospel is what Jesus did for us, not what we can do for ourselves. Yeah. And this is something that I, you know, I have been blessed with lots of people that told me, shared the gospel with me many times in wonderful ways. But even still, every time I would come to communion for the longest time, it was a time of shame. It was not a time of feasting with my Lord. It was, am I really good enough to be here? You know, mm-hmm. like, did I do better than last time? And when that's your mindset, it's it's like, you're missing the point. It's done. It's completed. Mm-hmm. You should obey and serve, serve your Lord joyfully. But you're coming to this table as a, a feast with your Lord and Savior. And I, it's so easy to miss that and just heap shame on yourself and completely miss Christ in the in something that is entirely centered on him. <laughs> mm-hmm. As pastors and elders, we're required to give some kind of warning and admonition, the traditional words of fencing. But sometimes we make such a big deal about who can't come that you're right, that you get we get exactly what you have. We get everyone's thinking about how horrible their sins are and how much they failed, and we miss the very point of the supper. 
Right. And Jesus mm-hmm. gave himself for us and gives, continues to give himself to us. And we, as long as we're believing that, however much we screwed up that week, if the faith is real and our joy in him is real, he forgives us. He receives us. And mm-hmm. then we should walk away exhilarated, thankful, joyful, not feeling like, should I really have eaten this time? I'm not right. sure. I kind of feel guilty about the whole thing. Amen. And this is why we do recos, so that we can talk about this. <laughs> Not talk just about the things our, we didn't yeah. want to talk about. Things we couldn't right. squeeze in artificially. Yeah. All right. What's your reco, Greg? Well, my, my recommendation isn't nearly as fun and creative as yours, um, both of yours. But I'm trying to think in terms of the books that influenced me as I was working on the original hard copy form of Halting Towards Zion. This book is The Ancient City by, I will try to pronounce it right and fail, Fustel de Kalangis. Oh, I know Kalangis. this book. You oh, know this book. Okay. I know this book. Subtitle, A Classic Study of the Religious and Civil Institutions of Ancient Greece and Rome. The book I recommended okay. last time is what came before Greece and Rome. This is Greece and Rome and, and classic civilization. And since we're talking, Zion, we're talking about the New Jerusalem. We're talking about where history and eternity are heading. And it's about a city. It starts in a garden. It ends in the New Jerusalem. And so this idea of what cities are, both in Christ and outside of Christ, is terribly important to the conversations we're going to be having. And um, Harvey Cox will eventually write a book called The Secular City, where he summarizes a lot of this material brilliantly and then goes off and does weird stuff with it. I, for that rec- for that, I do recommend The Secular City by, by Harvey Cox, but he's drawing from, from this book particularly. And the focus here is very simple. Cities are religious. They are inescapably religious. We build them because of our, of our religious worldview and our religious commitment to one another in terms of that religion. And it's always been that way. The, the, the cities of the pagan world were not secular entities. They were religious entities built around the worship, generally of an ancestor. They worship the, the ancient world worshiped the dead. And we see it clearly in Egypt. But what we, we try to rationalize Greece so much, and, and to a lesser degree Rome, that we miss what's really going on there. So this is a wonderful introduction to show the magical and religious origins of the of the city and the ancient world as over against God's city, which is the product of his grace in Christ. Yeah. That's great. And the, the religion of the state certainly isn't dead. We sing songs yeah. to our state. We make oaths to our state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I just read uh, the Wikipedia article on the author of the Pledge of Allegiance. Look it up. This is Wikipedia, mm-hmm. the, the friendly, yeah. neutral we right. love all socialists. It's bad. <laughs> By the time you're done, it's this is the guy. What was going on mm-hmm. here? Anyway. Yeah. I think that's it for the evening. All right. All right. Hey, thank you so much for being here, Greg and Jacob. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. You can check out our Facebook page, Halting Towards Zion. You can send us an email. Tell us what you think. Uh, tell us what you're reading and listening to and watching. Our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. I think that's it. We hope to see you next week.